Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Teddy Roosevelt the Trustbuster Part 5, Meat Grinder by Extra History. I know it has been a while since we did Part 4, I took a bit of a hiatus from the channel, but I thought we should finally come back to this series and finish it. Now, forgive me if I'm a little fuzzy on Parts 1 through 4, because it has been a while, but last time, we talked a bit about the Muckrakers, particularly Ida Tarbell, who has been a main character of this story, exposing some of the corruption of big business, and we took a look at the Hepburn Act, which gave the ICC some control over railroad rates. Today, we will see the final part in this series that has been basically focused on Theodore Roosevelt and his trust-busting efforts. If I'm remembering correctly, I think we'll talk about Upton Sinclair in this episode, and the title of this one does sort of suggest that. So, if you guys enjoy this one, please subscribe to the channel, and without any further ado, let's jump right into it. Chicago, Illinois, 1904. Mm -hmm. Upton Sinclair has realized that, provided he carries a lunch pail, he can go basically anywhere. Hey, people often say this. You, uh, you put on sort of a high-vis vest. Maybe this is today's version of what Sinclair is doing. You put on a high-vis vest, you can basically go anywhere. Go into any... I mean, I wouldn't recommend trying this, but people just assume you're some sort of official. Uh, must be here for some sort of inspection. <laughs> that is what Upton Sinclair is doing, but with a lunch pail. <laughs> Blending in with workers while walking the floors of Chicago's infamous slaughterhouses and packing plants, watching men work industrial meat cutters and grinders. His goal is to expose the grotesque labor abuses of the meat industry in a serialized novel he's writing for the socialist newspaper, Appeal to Reason. Right. He sees workers lose fingers to saws and subsequently lose their jobs and financial security. Yeah, Upton Sinclair is doing what we've seen a couple of writers of this era, this progressive era, doing is inserting themselves into these working class spaces and exposing them to the public. Right? This was done through photographs, through books, through newspapers. Really, the newspapers and the photography were a big part of it because for the first time, the sort of general public, especially the middle-class public who actually had sort of the power and money to maybe change some of this, were seeing a lot of these labor abuses through newspapers and through the photographs shown in newspapers. And so Upton Sinclair, the socialist, is setting out to do this in Chicago's meatpacking industry, show the horrible conditions, the long hours, you know, people getting their fingers chopped off, you know, their hands, you know, the extremely dangerous machinery. And he writes the book, The Jungle, which I haven't read, but uh, if you're American, some of you might have read it in like high school. I know some people did, uh, I did not. Um, and it's a book aimed at exposing these horrible working conditions. Um, it does that, but it doesn't exactly have the impact Sinclair intends it to, and I reckon we'll see that in this video. Witnesses the mistreatment of the largely Lithuanian immigrants working the factories. Hear stories of men falling into meat grinders, minced with the meat, and sees foul droppings and Ugh. diseased meat swept off the floor and put into sausages. The resulting novel, The Jungle, will spur Roosevelt's next big battle against the trusts. Yes, it will. Thanks so much to CuriosityStream for helping to keep the history flowing. Despite being labeled a socialist by his conservative Republican <laughs> rivals, Theodore Roosevelt, in actuality, had little regard for socialism. Yeah. In fact, he was largely pro-business. Much like Ida Tarbell, he didn't particularly care how large the trusts got, provided they did it honestly. Yeah, it's interesting, Theodore Roosevelt, and you know, his uh, cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, also gets this accusation. They both get accused of being socialists, but this is not true. Um, you know, Theodore Roosevelt in particular was actually quite anti-socialist. I mean, really, if you're a sort of prominent Western leader of this era, you know, you're going to be pretty anti-socialist. You know, if you're someone making it into parliamentary politics, you're probably more of a liberal type, not a socialist. Um, and Theodore Roosevelt is a good example of that. Um, sure, he does have rules he wants to enforce, but he's very pro-capitalism. He's very pro-free market. He's pro a regulated free market, but he is very pro-free market. Uh, he is certainly not in favor of socialism. Like I said, FDR often got this as well. 
Um, you know, FDR did sponsor, of course, a lot of government programs, but from his perspective, he would always frame it like he was trying to save capitalism from a collapse, uh, and so he utilized the government to do that, um, but he was always trying to rescue the free market and rescue capitalism, so, you know, he would not have accepted the f term socialist either, even though a lot of people would have called him a socialist at the time. Same with Teddy. Actually, it could be argued that his reputation as a radical trust buster is undeserved. Since he didn't really bust most of the trusts he went after, he was really more of a trust regulator. Yeah. In fact, Roosevelt didn't believe trusts were inherently bad, and he often admired the charity work undertaken by captains of industry like Rockefeller and Carnegie. And any time someone proposed actual social... Yeah, the whole little gospel of wealth idea that uh, these guys put forward, the idea that, you know, you make as much money as possible doing your business and all that sort of stuff, and then you pay off your sins <laughs> once you're done by, you know, setting up charities and setting up libraries. And, you know, Carnegie was a big advocate of this idea. This is why, you know, uh, I lived in Pittsburgh for a bit. You'll see a lot of Carnegie libraries... You know, a lot of public institutions branded with the name Carnegie because after he made all of his money through horrific exploitation, he tries to sort of, you know, like I said, pay off his sins by buying and paying for all of these different public institutions and giving money away. That was uh, this is referred to as the gospel of wealth. It was a rather prominent idea among some of these industrialists, uh, Carnegie in particular policies, like nationalizing the railroads, Roosevelt generally ran the other direction because he disliked socialism and socialists, and as a result, was skeptical of Upton Sinclair's claims when he first read The Jungle, yeah. particularly since Sinclair's novel ended with a heavy-handed scene of the protagonist attending a socialist meeting. As a yeah, Theodore Roosevelt was like not that much of a fan of Sinclair in The Jungle. Um, I, I can't remember on the top of my head, but there are a couple of quotes from when he read the book. Or I don't know where they're from, but, you know, there are some quotes Teddy gave in regard to the book, and they are not very positive, you know? He does not like Sinclair's socialist orientation. He very much doubts some of the stuff he's writing. Uh, but, I mean, the book made a big impact regardless. The way to lecture and convert the reader. Despite that, he invited Sinclair to the White House. To I like it, Upton, Upton Sinclair, U.S. <laughs> he's got the United States pin. <laughs> no, it's just his name, but it's kind of funny. Talk about the book and the conditions in the meat plants. Of course, he thought Sinclair was exaggerating and even referred to him crack as a crackpot. Pot. Yeah. But if just a third of what Sinclair claimed was true, then that meant there was something very wrong in the nation's meat industry. The picture of poverty, exploitation, and the revoltingly unhygienic practices he'd painted in the jungle was so viscerally upsetting to the public that both domestic and international orders for American meat dropped by half. Right, and, and what we're going to see here is, and the impact I was talking about, so you got to keep in mind the reading audience, right? And like I mentioned earlier, when we talk about the general public, the reading public, we're talking about a lot of people, but in particular, we are talking about sort of this growing middle class, this white collar class of people who have the time and money and leisure to read and get involved in politics and all that sort of stuff, right? And so when this group reads the book, sort of the main thing they take away from it, and like they said, the book was very visceral, is they are disgusted by the conditions. They are viscerally disgusted by some of the descriptions of, you know, feces and human body parts being chopped into the food and ground up to make sausage. And, you know, people are outraged, you know, uh, as they said, the American meat industry takes a hit. And so people, the sort of interesting thing about it is that some of the labor conditions actually take sort of a backseat to some of the conditions in regards to the food. Like, people are disgusted uh, because it affects them, right? They think, oh my god, I eat the meat products of this company, and this is how it's being made? That's horrific. And there's a this famous quote by Upton Sinclair that I'm sure a lot of you have heard, and I, I'm going to butcher it, but it goes something like, you know, in writing the book, uh, I aimed at the heart of the American people, but by accident, I hit their stomach. Right? It's something like that. And the point he's making is that, you know, I was sort of, I was aiming for the heart, right? I was trying to show the poverty and terrible working conditions of these laborers. But instead, what people most took away 
was the terrible conditions in regards to the production of the food. That was the biggest impact the book made. So, yeah, you know, it's an interesting little thing about the jungle. So despite his skepticism, Roosevelt dispatched a group of his most trusted government officials to inquire about plant conditions. Surprise inspections, which the Meat Trust unfortunately got wind of and went on a three-week sanitation campaign. Mm -hmm. But even that wasn't enough. When Roosevelt received the subsequent report, he was shocked to discover that Sinclair had not lied about factory conditions. They discovered unbelievable filth, from walls painted with old blood, to tuberculosis-infected beef being packaged for sale, to rotting pork being bathed in preservatives like formaldehyde and borax, <laughs> to meat that was entirely mislabeled, <laughs> passing off goat or horse as beef. I mean, we still see some of that today, frankly. Popular fury was so intense that this was one blow against the trusts Roosevelt wouldn't even have to fight for. Yeah. He drew up two bills for the 1906 Congress. The first was the Pure Food and Drug Act, a wide-ranging statute that banned the foreign and interstate traffic of mislabeled, impure, or contaminated food and medicine. It allowed for the U.S. Bureau of Chemistry, later renamed the Food and Drug Administration, mm -hmm. to carry out inspections and refer violations to prosecutors. It also required the food and drug manufacturers to label major ingredients. Yeah, like they said, this was one that he got through much uh, more easily than some of his other policies. And I think, you know, I sort of talked about it earlier, but there is something to... This sort of affects everybody, so everybody's really outraged by the conditions of the food because they're all eating the food, right? And so we get something like the FDA and, you know, controls on these types of things that are relatively uncontroversial, though, you know, everything's become very political at the moment, so you have some people who don't like such government agencies, but, you know, up until at least recently, these types of things were relatively sort of nonpartisan and non-controversial, I guess. And I do think that's part of the reason why they were passed through so easily is that, you know, once again, it affects everybody and it's less relevant to sort of labor or maybe like, you know, straight up business practice. I think it's because it's less relevant to labor than some of the other things we've seen throughout this series, which do tend to be a lot more controversial and a lot more openly political or at least openly partisan. Um, and, you know, that's what Sinclair was going for, was a look at the labor conditions of this industry. But if you're a certain type of person, you have a certain type of political bent, you read that and you don't care or you hand wave it or, you know, you, you just don't think it's a problem worth fixing or it's not a problem at all. But I think it's for the vast majority of people, they look at the condition of the food and they agree that something must be done, right? Right. So it's sort of a lot easier to get this kind of stuff through. A provision striking out at both mislabeled meat and the U.S. patent medicine industry, which regularly sold products with secret yeah. ingredients that included cocaine and opium. <laughs> In fact, many of these medicines were also loaded with sugars and flavoring, which led to a rash of children overdosing when they drank the bottles like candy. It also labeled 10 substances common in medicine, including alcohol, opium, cocaine, cannabis, and morphine as addictive and dangerous, requiring that their presence be disclosed on the packaging. Products found in violation could be seized and destroyed at the company's expense in addition to a fine. Next came the Federal Meat Inspection Act, which mandated Department of Agriculture inspections of every animal before and after slaughter, spelled out standards for sanitation at meat plants, and authorized the government to monitor operations. And, I mean, we're seeing a real centralization here, you know, and this comes with the development first of sort of the modern centralized state, and then with the increase in bureaucracy and sort of the political crusades advanced by the progressive era, we start to see a lot of these systems, whether they be interstate commerce, railroads, uh, business of all kinds, the meat industry, medicine, food, that were not really taken on by the federal government, or at least the federal government had very reduced power over them. We begin to see the federal, the national government getting involved and implementing regulation and laws and controls on a lot of these products and, you know, you can see how we're sort of building up to where we are today, where we have a country, a society, an economy that is much more federally regulated. I mean, you think about, say, the medicine, and even if you just think sort of stereotypically about the medicines of the late 1800s, 
you think about all the miracle cures that were going around for everything. And I mean, you know, we still get a lot of that today. Um, but we have this system that's developed, you know, FDA regulated. And, you know, today you, you got to have those sorts of regulations and controls. And if you don't, then at least a lot of people know not to trust it. Now, people are always getting fooled by miracle cures and fake medicines and all that kind of stuff. But we, you know, we see the implementation of this sort of regulation around the turn of the 20th century, you know, the, the early 1900s. Despite these two victories, Sinclair himself was disappointed that people had fixated on food purity right. rather than the condition of workers. I aimed for the heart, he reflected, uh, there you and go. hit them in the stomach. I knew they did. There's the famous quote. You can't go over the story without using it. <laughs> but even so, it was the end of an extraordinary legislative season. In fact, the 59th U.S. Congress was one of the most productive in history. In addition to the Pure Food and Drug Act, Meat Inspection Act, and Hepburn Railroad Rates Act, the 59th Congress also passed a key law regulating citizenship, an Antiquities Act allowing the president to declare national monuments, and chartered the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement <laughs> of Teaching, which played a major role in developing American education. Mm -hmm. But despite all this success, it should be noted that the Food and Drug Act and Meat Inspection Act were compromises, watered down from what Roosevelt had truly hoped for. I mean, we've seen that throughout this series. That was true for the Hepburn Raid Act. Uh, that's been true for a lot of these bills. So they're all compromises. Uh, I mean, when you have a system like this, you know, the American system with balance of power and checks and balances, basically any bill you propose is going to be some type of compromise. Uh, and yeah, we can see that with the you know, presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, even though a lot of his bills were big changes. If you look into them, it was not necessarily as major as, you know, some people think. A lot were compromises watered down from the original vision. Compromise was something Roosevelt increasingly became familiar with during his last years in office. Hmm. Because in the exuberance of his election night win in 1904, he'd made a promise that he now regretted. Having served nearly two terms due to McKinley's assassination, right. he had promised not to run again. And while that freed his hand to be more active and take politically risky positions in his second term, it also meant that both the trusts and conservative Republicans knew that they just had to wait him out. In 1908, he proposed a bill to strengthen the Sherman Antitrust Act, but saw it shot down in Congress. He then tried to set up a National Bureau of Insurance in order to tame anti-consumer practices in the insurance markets, but that was- hey, This is one we've been working on for a long time. And uh, at least in America, still have not fixed. <laughs> but yeah, uh, they're making the point here that, you know, in America, the sort of two-term tradition uh, sort of became and remains, well, now it's in law, but sort of became sacred, right? Because of George Washington served two terms. Now, there was no law barring people serving two terms, of course, until Franklin Delano Roosevelt, second mention in this video, um, after him, you know, uh, he served for a long time. Uh, yeah, uh, there was a change. But at least up until him, uh, there was no law amendment preventing uh, candidates, presidents from serving more than two terms. But it was the norm. And it was a very widely accepted norm. And Roosevelt is basically saying, you know, he hasn't technically served two terms, but he, because of how he got into office through the assassination and him taking over from vice president to president, he says, you know, I've basically served two terms, right? If we want to measure it in time. And so I won't run for another, but you know, I mean, people want power. People in power want to hold on to their power. That's the way of things. I, I mean, there's a more generous way of framing it, you know? You could say that Teddy wanted to continue the good work he was doing, um, which is surely partly true, but also people in power want to hold on to their power. It's the way of things. And so you see this throughout history. And I guess this is one of the reasons why Washington was so remarkable was that uh, he stepped away. And that, that's pretty rare. And frankly, Washington really didn't want the job of president in the first place. But most people who get a position will hold on to that position, even if they make a promise that they will not run again. And they'll usually try and run again. Dead on arrival as well. However, even without Congress, Roosevelt could affect change. 
sometimes merely by the threat of an antitrust suit. Right. Andrew Carnegie's U.S. Steel, the most prominent steel trust, actually voluntarily agreed to an investigation by the Bureau of Corporations, and other large trusts agreed to cooperate as well. But there was one time he couldn't help but let the trusts win. November 4th, 1907, the White House. The country is in a panic. Stock market dives and the sudden crash of several trust banks, wiping out depositor savings, have plunged consumer confidence. People are terrified, moving their money out of the market, and worse, withdrawing it from banks. If this continues, the entire system might collapse. Yeah. But J.P. Morgan, a man Roosevelt has tangled with when he filed an antitrust suit over the Northern Securities Company, has a plan. You see, part of this new panic of 1907 had come from a large brokerage house, borrowing massive sums with the Tennessee Coal, Iron, and Railroad Company as collateral. But now that TCNI stock price was collapsing, if U.S. Steel purchased TCNI, it would calm the markets. Huh? However, U.S. Steel already owns 60% of the steel market and doesn't want to face an antitrust suit as a monopoly. Hmm. So they ask for Roosevelt to sign off on it personally. They will save the economy, but in return, he can't go after them for the purchase. It's Monday morning. The stock market will open in an hour. Roosevelt has to decide fast. <sighs> he has no choice. He agrees to let the deal go through. So you can see the trade-off in this decision, right? The idea is that you pick the economy up from a crash, but you centralize power more and more in the hands of one company. Frankly, one man, J.P. Morgan. And, you know... We see the crashes of these era. They're, they're sort of precursors of the big one to come, the Great Depression. Uh, and frankly, you know, in the Great Depression, that's sort of the culmination of the sort of a lot of the big business free market policy of this entire era. We see where all this culminates. You know, you increasingly uh, allow the market to run amok in these businesses more and more power. So... In this decision, uh, Roosevelt decides to allow this to go through, but what it does is it, it does allow Morgan more power and more control uh, for the price of him sort of bolstering the stock market. Ultimately, Roosevelt would use the Sherman Antitrust Act 40 more times during his presidency, more than his three predecessors combined. And his ally and chosen successor, William Howard Taft, would use it 75 times. But while Roosevelt's battle against the trusts has become legendary, the results themselves were more mixed. As we mentioned previously, the breakup of Standard Oil, his biggest victory, may not have actually led to much more competition. Yeah, I think that, you know, when you look at the long-term consequences of this, I think, you know, first of all, there's what we mentioned, which is that a lot of the policy was more compromised than you might think. And some of the achievements though they're remembered very fondly, are more mixed when you look into them, right? And that's true for most things, frankly, when you think about a grand achievement. When you sort of dig in, everything is more mixed than you initially think it is. Everything is more complicated, right? That, that's sort of how history works, frankly. So there's that. And then there's also the fact that if you give it the long term, and of course, you know, Theodore Roosevelt never could have known this, right? One man can only control so much, can only see so far into the future, Right? So at this point, we've gone beyond Roosevelt. But when you sort of zoom out, we see that you know a lot of the trust busting and regulation done during this era and then post-Great Depression under FDR, you know, a lot of this type of policy that in some ways limited the power of big business and added more controls and added more aid to you know, the people, a lot of this over time has been sort of started to be rolled back. And a lot of the trust busting, a lot of the regulation, a lot of these companies are now starting to conglomerate again, right? And we see the American economy uh, over the past couple of decades, the past couple of years, but really the past couple of decades, um, you know, the American economy is increasingly dominated by a smaller and smaller number of these gigantically prosperous and powerful corporations, right? Sort of a similar thing that we saw in the late 1800s, which is sort of where we began our story with these massive companies and the robber barons monopolizing the economy. And then Teddy Roosevelt comes along in the early 1900s to fix it. We sort of see a similar picture forming today, 
where we have a couple and at this point, you know, they're not steel companies, they're tech companies, right? We see Apple and Meta and Amazon, right? And all these companies, Microsoft, that are really dominating the economy in a massive, massive way. And our economy becomes more and more reliant on these small number of massive companies, right? So I think we are facing sort of a similar issue. And there have been some attempts to regulate and control this growth, uh, this monopolization, and they've mostly failed or mostly fallen flat because of the power that these companies hold. So, you know, it's a mixed picture. It's very mixed, actually. The initial achievements are more mixed than many believe. And when you zoom out, we have in some ways returned to where we once were. In other ways, of course, we, we have massive improvements. Uh, but just in terms of sort of corporate power and monopolization of the economy, it seems like we are heading in that direction once again. In the 1920s, when Ida Tarbell wrote a retrospective article on standards breakup, she pointed out that over a decade later, the competition that the government had hoped to create hadn't yet materialized. Right. Maybe, she suggested, it would take another decade for the results to truly begin to show. <laughs> Indeed, in our modern uh, day, maybe. we can actually see maybe, Ida. parts of standard recombining via merger yeah. with Exxon and Mobil joining forces. But it's important to note that even these mega corporations only have a fraction of the power Standard once had, yeah. particularly because they fear antitrust suits. Breakups are rare, but in 1982, AT&T was forced to divest itself of the Bell telephone system. A 1999 case came close to breaking up Microsoft, and as we wrote this series, the Justice Department filed an antitrust suit against Google, and the Federal Trade Commission, the successor to Roosevelt's Bureau of Corporations, filed another against Facebook. Sure, but like I said, there have been attempts to regulate, but I want you to notice that some of these attempts they've been talking about have been attempts and not successes. And uh, I don't know when this video came out, probably, uh, well, let me check actually. Let's see when this video came out. Two years ago, 2021, but well, essentially three years ago, you know, have we seen much more success in regulation and antitrust? I'd say probably not. Right? So, I don't know. Um, I would not end this story with an upswing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I mean, the regulatory uh, systems are there and the bodies are there to perform this regulation. And the regulation is attempted, but it seems largely unsuccessful, um, at least right now. But I, I guess we'll see. You know, maybe you can watch this video <laughs> 10, 20 years from now, right? Uh, maybe... I'm as wrong as Ida was, right? In the opposite direction. Or maybe not. I don't know. Which just goes to show that even a century later, the big questions of Roosevelt's era still live on. Yeah. Should the government provide a check on unrestrained capitalism? How can Congress regulate when its members are financially tied to companies? Yep. And what role does the press play in all of this? Yeah, I, I, I think especially that middle question. These are the big questions of politics today. How can politicians legislate against corporations when their pockets are stuffed with the money of those corporations? Well, I'd say they can't. <laughs> they, they can't. Um, but yeah, these are the big questions of today, and, and they still remain. Um, yeah. Because while Theodore Roosevelt gave us the tools to act if warranted, the question of when to use them is still up to us. Sure. And if you're interested... Well, it's not up to me, but... <laughs> if it was up to me, things would be different. But, uh, sure, they're up to us as a society. I mean, they're, they're up to our leaders in many ways. I guess it depends on how much you think can change. But anyway, let's not get too political with it, right? I, but I do think that these questions are still very relevant today. And not only are they relevant, but they really are some of the central questions of our political moment. And they have been, and they will remain some of the central questions of our country. I really do think, you know, questions of money and politics, the power of corporations, regulation of those corporations. I don't see those questions going away. I mean, you know, it's been more than 100 years since what we're describing here. And those questions haven't gone away. So why would they go away in the following 100 years? That's sort of what I think. But uh, I don't know. I'd be interested to hear what y'all think. Um... Yeah, we finally finished the series. <laughs> Sorry for taking a massive break in the middle. 
Um, I just wanted to come back, do the final part, do part five. So I, at least I could say I have the whole series done now. Uh, anyway, I, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Uh, if you did, please leave a like, subscribe, you know, all that good stuff. I found this series perfectly interesting. Um, I guess at the start of it, I did kind of think it'd be more about Roosevelt's presidency as a whole, but it ended up being specifically about the trust busting, um, which I was perfectly fine with. I think that made an interesting series. Uh, anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this one. Hope you're all having a good day today, and I will see you again next time. Goodbye.